appreciate it. God bless you. Well, Sarah and I are delighted to be with you today, and uh, she's here. We've been married since 1973. This is my lovely wife, Sarah. 48 years, and uh, we were just chatting yesterday. What are we going to do for our 50th? It's coming up, 50, a half a century. It's unbelievable. These people were just a thought in the mind of God when you and I married. That's right. But uh, those of you online, thank you for joining us today, and we're so grateful. The other uh, satellite settings, the church is there, but we are honored that Pastor Marco would invite us to come and just to hear all the wonderful things that are going on in the lives of so many of you. It's just a, a joy for me to hear this. We travel a lot and see a lot of things. This is just a delight. You are unique in so many ways in what you're doing, and uh, I'm grateful for what I've heard about the testimony, even what we heard up there. What a blessing. You know, when Sarah and I were dating and uh, fell in love and uh, I proposed to her to, to marry, you know, I didn't say to her, Sarah, you know, I hate you and you hate me, so let's get married. <laughs> and, and none of us start that way. So how do we get to a point where there's heated fellowship? And we get in one sense derailed and it's kind of like we have a sense that God has called us together. There's a purpose for us. We're excited. We're in love. We're, we have a vision. And then over a period of time, we begin to kind of feel like they're not hearing us. Maybe we don't matter to them. We can't be good enough. And attention begins to arise. And these conflicts seem to happen more than what we thought was normal. And we begin to think that maybe we made a mistake. Some of us do. Others look around and we see people who seem to be so happy, but not us. And so we begin to wonder what's, what's really going on here. And it's disconcerting. Well, one real reason is just honest misunderstanding. You know, you didn't marry Hitler's distant cousin. There's not evil will. There's not ill will. It's an honest misunderstanding. I want us to see a video clip of a couple that obviously had a little tension, a little heated fellowship, and I want you to be mindful of the fact that both are trying to bring happiness to the other. But watch what happens in this video clip. So this morning I'm making coffee. I said to my wife, are you having coffee? If you're making it. Well, yeah, I'm making it. So you're going to have some? If you make it, I will. How about just yes? I'm going to make some coffee. Do you want some? Yes, I'd like to have some coffee. That's all I want to know because you're having coffee is a difference between making 12 or six cups. I just want to know, are you having some coffee? Well, if it's made, I'll have some. What? I understand that some code that I'm supposed to understand. I've been doing this for 25 years, but yes or no sometimes, I need that. Do you want to go out and eat tonight? Well, I don't think I have anything to cook. Okay. Okay, so you want to go out. Well, I think I can make eggs. So we're staying home. I don't think I have enough eggs for both of us. So you want to go out and eat? Because if you want to go out and eat, I'll take you to Mama Santa's. I like pizza. Okay, so you want to go to Mama Santa's? Well, I had pizza yesterday. Okay, so no Mama Santa's. I can eat pizza every day. Then let's go. Why can't you just say yes? Just say yes. So then we get to the restaurant. Do you want me to grab your jacket? It's always so cold in there. So do you want your jacket? Well, I kind of have a long sleeve shirt on. Okay, so no jacket? I'm starting to feel chilly already. Yes, the jacket? As we're leaving the restaurant, I'm like, I'm going to use the bathroom. You have to go? Well, I have to go to the grocery store. Okay, so you can use the bathroom at the grocery store? Well, I guess I can go tomorrow. What, to the bathroom or to the store? <laughs> well, if I don't go to the store tonight, then I have nothing to cook for tomorrow. No, 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 we're going to the store. I am not going through this again tomorrow. <laughs> oh, no. Is that great? And why are we laughing? Because that captures at times our relationship, doesn't it? But what's fascinating here, you can see how this second sequel to this thing or the sequel to this, suddenly now she's getting frustrated, uh, frustrated with him because it's like he's mad at her. And he's upset because there's some code he's to figure out and she's just setting him up for failure. You see what we begin to do? When the truth is, it's in, the, in the literature, academic literature, women are deferential. It's called hedging. She doesn't want to control him. She doesn't want a boss. So she's deferential all the way through, which to him is indirect and not saying yes. When you think she's trying to control you, often she's doing just the opposite and that frustrates you. Well, if you're going to make it, I will. She's deferring to him, wanting him to be happy. 
He's trying to serve her at every point. But you can see two people with good will ending up not liking each other. And it's fascinating to think about because we misunderstand each other. I had a couple come to our Love and Respect conference and uh, they were uh, next week traveling somewhere in the car together. She wanted to see how he felt about her. And so she said to him, you know, after the conference, have you been thinking about this? How, how do you feel about me? He said, you're very critical. <laughs> so she was about to verbally pounce on him and just go after him, but she waited because she knew he was a man of good will, so she wanted to have clarification because she can't believe that he just said that. She said, can you tell me what you just meant by what you just said? Well, yes, I've been thinking about you since the conference, that if you died, I couldn't make it. You're very critical to my survival. <laughs> Wife worked all day fixing a meal. They're now seated together, and she said, that's the worst meal I've ever made. No, it's not, honey. <laughs> what did he mean? <laughs> that's not the worst meal you've made. <laughs> Let me tell you that. Or, no, you've never made a bad meal. This is happening all the time in relationships. And we're going to have to step back and ask ourselves, have we gotten derailed and has heated fellowship resulted because of honest misunderstandings? It doesn't mean that there isn't evil. But my campaign has, when we first launched Love and Respect, 150 radio stations, syndicated programs had me on. And the number, if we had Q&A, always people asking about abuse, 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 abuse. I said, I'm not here. You have to decide that. I'm here to serve people who have basic goodwill. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, 33 and 34, the husband is concerned about how to please his wife. The wife is concerned about how to please her, her uh, husband. Now, my dad attempted to strangle my mother to death. My mom separated for five years. We were not Christ followers. They sent me to a military school from eighth grade to 12th grade. Uh, the woundedness, I spoke to 12,000 students at Liberty University about being the wounded healer. I come out of pain, and many of you understand that. So I'm not minimizing that. But I'm here to serve people who basically, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't marry Hitler's distant cousin. Yeah, they've got issues and serious issues. And if you're in harm's way, you get out. But I'm here to help people who I think get derailed due to honest, honest misunderstanding, not, not evil intent. Because it, it didn't start out with, I hate you, you hate me, so let's get married. Now, again, I'm not going to minimize. If adulteries happen, there's a physical abuse and... A, but often it doesn't start there, and I'm not going to justify where it goes, but in those early weeks and months when we start getting to a point where we just don't like each other, I think it's this kind of thing that you just saw portrayed here. Ongoing misunderstanding, and eventually we begin to feel, you're not hearing me. And so therefore, because I've said this countless times before, I must not matter to you. You really don't love me. You really don't respect me. Have you ever had a conflict with your spouse when suddenly the issue didn't seem to be the issue? And you see their spirit deflate? What is the issue when the issue isn't the issue? I believe the Apostle Paul reveals to us something that's very, very important. And he does so in Ephesians 5.33 where he says, The husband must love his wife and the wife must respect her husband. Now, let me insert, we all need love and respect equally, but Paul is gender specific here. I've asked 7,000 people this question. When you're in a conflict with your spouse, do you most often feel unloved during that conflict or disrespected? 83% of the men said they feel disrespected. 72% of the women say they feel unloved. Does she need R-E-S-P-E-C-T? Absolutely. Paul says, honor her as a fellow of the grace of life. The true need, we both need love and respect equally. Let me say it again. Listen to me. We all need love and respect equally. 
He needs love. She needs respect. We're talking about a felt need during conflict, the way blue interprets his world, the way pink interprets her world during conflict. Now, at the least of reason, when men are in conflict with their wives, they don't think, you don't love me. Typically, that never is because she, by nature, she nurtures. Women love to love at the level of intimacy. She can't not love. She's not commanded in Scripture, in marriage, to love her husband with agape love. Did you know that? Only husbands are commanded because God made you to love. Now, in Titus 2, the older women encourage younger women to love their husbands, love their children. That's filet, oh, not agape. Not filet your husband, <laughs> but be his friend. You're just not friendly. He knows you love him, but he thinks you don't like him. And men shut down on that. And then we claim they're narcissistic. Johnny Feldhahn did a research, random sample of 400 men in America, decision analyst out of Houston did this, and she called me and said, here, I'd like to ask this question of the American male. Perfect sample of the American male. Would you men rather be left alone and unloved in the world or be viewed as inadequate and disrespected by everyone? Almost three quarters of the men said they'd rather be left alone and unloved in the world. Men are very vulnerable when you send a message, you're an inadequate human being, you're never good enough, and I don't respect you any farther than I could throw you. Men serve and die for honor. This is huge. Pat Riley had me come speak to the Miami Heat. He and I spent almost five hours talking about men and what motivates men. I'm with this icon who knows it better than anybody. We talked about the fact that when men feel that you don't treat them fairly and you don't honor them for who they are, there will be mutiny. They'll jump ship or they'll throw you over ship. Men need to feel that they're being treated fairly and honored. And if you honor them, you can confront them all day long about things they're not doing that's right. But if you communicate something to them that doesn't feel just and doesn't feel honorable, they'll close off. This idea that you, you're inadequate, I don't respect you, you're not, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's hard for us. That's not due to narcissism, which the profiling industry and the counseling industry is doing. You can, I could write this script stuff and, and incriminate your son who's married now. I could just completely incriminate him and have your sweet daughter-in-law hate his heart. The truth is, we're, we're at a point where we need to listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 19.4. Have you not read, he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? Not wrong, just different. There's an XX and XY chromosome. And God made us different. There's sperm in the egg. And it isn't going to result in any other way than population is going to continue to be increased through that. God designed that. So now here's the deal. What happens though, she looks at the world differently. A woman says, I have nothing to wear. What she means is she has nothing new, right? Her husband says, I have nothing to wear. What he means is he has nothing clean. How can you say the same sentence? I have nothing to wear. I have nothing to wear. Same sentence, different meanings. It's an innocent illustration, but to bring home the point that there's a pink and blue worldview. She has pink hearing aids, pink sunglasses, speaks through a pink megaphone. He has blue hearing aids, blue sunglasses, speaks through. But the culture of intimacy has become pink. And so we have to step back a little bit and look at it from a biblical worldview. What is God saying? What is he recorded? Well, what's interesting, if we don't get in tune with this pink and blue difference, Paul is pink and blue. Husbands, love your wives in Ephesians 5.30. This is the summary to the greatest treatise in the New Testament on marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. I mean, why do you need to say respect, respect, or love, love? Because he's getting at something within the nature of each of us, within the need of each of us. She needs to know that you love her. And he tends to know that you love him. Say, Harry, does your wife love you? Oh, yeah. she like you? No. It's true. He's not assured that you respect who he is in his deepest heart, made in the image of God. We're not talking about respecting bad behavior. Women say, I can't respect that. I can't respect Well, he can't love that and can't love that. He's talking about loving who you are and respecting or honoring his deepest heart because men serve and die for honor. In fact, one man said to his wife, I love you so much, I would die for you. She said, Harry, you keep saying that, but you never do. <laughs> So 
So what's Paul getting at? Apparently, there's something very fascinating. He needs to know that you respect who he is apart from his performance. I'm not going to respect my behavior. No man respects bad behavior. But we always honor the man inside. We speak, you're an honorable man. I don't know why you're doing this. I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. This is conduct I'm becoming of who I know God calls you to be. Why can't we say it that way? You can confront a man all day long as long as you don't show contempt toward his inner person. Any more than a man can show hostility and hate toward the spirit of a woman when he's upset. But we defend the woman. We haven't defined or defended the male. He just needs to take it. He's very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. But he doesn't cry. 85% of those who withdraw and stonewall and just back away is the man. Research has confirmed that again and again. University of Washington studied 2,000 couples for 20 years. Men withdraw and stonewall and they'll get angry and they'll pull away. And that's interpreted as unloving, and he's self-centered. It's all about him. No, it's not. He's trying to de-escalate because at that moment, his heartbeats are 99 beats per minute. Physiologically, he has to disengage. If Marco and I were best of buddies, we got into a heated moment, and we're really upset, we'll just finally say, drop it, forget it, we'll exit, because the relationship is more important than the issue on the table. But we need to understand when your husband does that. Now I say go away for 15 minutes, but come back for 15 minutes and talk for 15 minutes, not 15 hours. But nonetheless, the man will disengage not because he's unloving, but because he's trying to do the honorable thing, just as most women will criticize and complain during heated fellowship, during moments of conflict, because she cares. She cares deeply. But when she criticizes and complains on an ongoing basis, it feels like contempt to him, not care, and when he withdraws, it's really an act of honor, but to her it feels like an act of hostility. And we miss each other. There's an honest misunderstanding of what's going on. And so I discovered this crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. Without love, he reacts without respect. Without respect, she re- he, whatever, you know. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. And this baby starts to spin. And that's the issue, and the issue is an issue, usually. And what we do, though, is we dismiss the other because we can't believe that she would deflate over feeling unloved when we're trying to do the honorable thing. And she can't believe that we would deflate when she's trying to do the loving thing. And so we know we're right. We are convinced we're right. But could it ever be that both of us are right? We have this mindset that if I'm right, you've got to be. In the gray areas of life, that's not the way we do it. If it's a moral issue, yes. But most conflicts are these gray area issues. So what happens, this pink and blue difference in the gray area is escalated to a black and white matter. It's too judgmental. But we know we're right. And so what happens, we just keep spinning ad nauseum. This crazy cycle can go on for 40 years. Just keeps going. It's called the the cycle of negativity in the research, and it's toxic. The issue isn't really important. It's the chronic negative cycle, what I call the crazy cycle. That's the killer. And you finally just say, I'm done. And why? All because there was an honest misunderstanding. He's trying to do the honorable thing, not the unloving thing, when he pulls back to calm down. She's trying to do the loving thing when she complains and criticizes because she cares. She's a helper suitable, and she's moving toward you aggressively because she wants to connect, and she's insecure about your love, and she's seeking reassurance that you love her. And you say, I told you that 17 years ago, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. (laughs) Isn't it sad? that he's trying to do the honorable thing, especially on the heels of feeling disrespected. He's not trying to be unloving when he knows he'd die for you. And Jesus Christ said, no greater love is a man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. He knows. I mean, we just talk about Ukraine. All the men stayed to fight and die. Women, they wanted their wives and daughters to leave and mothers. We will do what we have to do. But we don't write poetry always. 
We don't have a sentimentality that God put within you as a woman. And so he looks like he's indifferent or unloving. Mm -mm, mm -mm. No, he can be, but not necessarily. Just because you feel that he is doesn't mean that he is. Just because you feel unloved doesn't mean that he, in fact, was being unloving. Did you say or do something earlier that was contemptuous and disrespectful and you showed disgust and he just pulled back as an honorable man to de-escalate the, the conflict because the relationship with you is more important than the issue? And does she come at you with a pointed finger, all the gestures of contempt and all, all the things that you look at? No man talks to you this way and you've told her, nobody talks to me that way. Everybody respects me but you. Sick and tired. When the fact is, she has a need that only you can meet. Her need to feel that you love her and that you're not going to walk out on her. Sean F. Heldon told me that her research points out that women are three conversations away fearing that their husband's going to say, I'm done. That insecurity drives her to be aggressive toward you, to connect, to talk. We need to talk. No, we don't. <laughs> now, there's a standoff there. But why is she that way? She's annoying. No. <laughs> she has a need that only you can meet, and she thinks you should figure that out. But nonetheless, you interpret her as disrespectful rather than just needing reassurance that you love her on the heels of maybe something you did that was very unloving and you know it, but you discount it and tell her to as well because you didn't mean it. So it's all about our interpretation of our spouse and of our own behavior. They're wrong. I'm right. Get over it. That lacks wisdom, lacks skill, and it won't work. So the question on the table is, well, what do we do? Well, there are many angles I could come at this today, and I wrote the book Love and Respect, and we talk about that crazy cycle, how to get off that crazy cycle. We talk about the energizing cycle. His love motivates her respect. Her respect motivates his love. And I explain what love is to a woman. I explain what respect. Women say, I have no idea what you're talking about. They have no idea. I don't, I don't have any idea. That's because it's been pulled from the marital radar screen in this culture. Yet men serve and die for honor. I mean, it is so hugely motivating to us. We soften. We move toward a woman. We connect when we feel that sense of honor toward our inner man, particularly on the heels of us doing something wrong. What you want is your husband to soften, turn toward you, move toward you, and listen. And you're doing everything that's pushing him away. Because no one's told you. Your heart's in the right place, but that doesn't mean that because you're motivated rightly that your methods are prudent. I mean, it's just something we all have to just step back. So often it's just the lack of skill and knowledge. It has nothing to do with ill will. Ignorance is not bliss. It's least a blister, so to speak. You know? <laughs> so I could talk about the crazy cycle, how to get off of it. I could talk about the energizing cycle, how to motivate and influence. We want to be energized and motivated and influenced. We want to come under the influence. We really do. When a woman is loved, she wants that. And when a man is honored, oh, man, it's powerful. And God said it right there in his word. But hey, we don't need to pay attention to it. We're doing fine. We'll just do it on our own. But I want to then talk about the third cycle in our few moments left called the rewarded cycle because here's what I have learned in my own marriage with Sarah and what we, you know, have tried to really lock into. And this is the deepest thing. In fact, when I was first launching Love and Respect, we, we, uh, we were out doing these conferences and there was a, we did one in Manhattan, New York, when this gal, she had several degrees from Harvard. There was a small group of people, some very smart people. And I talked about the crazy cycle and how, why do we negatively react to each other? And then the energizing cycle, how do we motivate each other? And then the third cycle, what do you do if your spouse isn't responding? And I talked very clearly about what God is saying in his word about that kind of dynamic. And she said, if you had started with where you ended, I would have listened to you at the beginning. <laughs> I, thought, I said, that was brilliantly said. I said, that, that's, that's, but, and I've had so many other people through the years say, if you just had told me that up front, I would have listened more to what you had said up front. 
So what is it that I ended with that maybe I should begin with? It's called the rewarded cycle. And in Ephesians, it's interesting. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is doctrine. 4, 5, and 6 is application. Colossians 1 and 2 is doctrine. 3 and 4, chapter 3 and 4, is application. Romans 1 through 8 and then 9 through 11 and then the end of the section of that epistle is uh, application. You'll see that. And then when they swing from doctrine to application, for instance, Ephesians, you'll see it. Husband-wife relationship, father-child relationship, master-slave, and sometimes like in Peter to be authority-citizen. But primarily it's those three with Paul in Ephesians and Colossians. So what's with this? This is where the Lord is watching. And it has nothing to do with beauty. It has nothing to do with status, with money, with nothing. It has nothing to do. I mean, we, we, we celebrate people who have symmetry and can remember their lines and they can dance. We celebrate the celebrities. The Lord's not impressed with that. It's not that they aren't goodwill people. I'm not impugning who they are. I'm just simply saying God looks at the heart and he's not looking for talent. He's not looking, I mean, all, all of the spiritual gifts, all of this, what, what he's watching for when he's looking from doctrine to application is first and foremost in, in marriage. That's where he's watching. And Paul talks again and again and again about something that we don't pay close attention to and it was based on what Jesus had taught. As you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to, to me. Jesus was saying, you've done it to me. He was saying, yes, this person's real and they're right in front of you and they can be irritated and they can be annoying, but ultimately you do what you do unto me. And Paul for 13 years was in Tarsus. He was, came to Christ in Damascus Road and then for about 14 years he goes to his own hometown. That's probably where he's beaten, whipped because that's the only time we... He, he talks about being whipped, and, but in the book of Acts, there's no indication that he was whipped the way he was describing in Corinthians. So we know that he was there about 14 years, and then the Holy Spirit descended on Antioch. Barnabas goes there, checks it out, comes to Tarsus, tells Paul. And Paul's ministry began when he's about 45, 46. He was probably about 30, 33 when he came to Christ, Damascus Road. So what's going on in that time period? He's memorizing the words of Jesus. As to the, do it to the least of these, you do it to me. As you do it to the least. We are to do what we do as to the Lord. It's all about as to the Lord. So in Ephesians 5.21, which some suggest begins the treatise on marriage, Paul says, be subject to one another in the reverence of Christ. It has nothing to do with this person. It has everything to do with your reverence for Christ. Then in verse 22, he says to the wives, you wives who potassal to your husbands as to the Lord. It isn't about your husband. It has nothing to do with him, Paul's saying. Then you continue on in verse like 25 and 20. Paul now talks to the husband. You husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he repeats that, as, just as Christ loved the church. We do what we do in imitation. We love our wives in imitation of Jesus Christ. We are Christ conscious. What Paul does, he goes from the horizontal constantly to the vertical. And he says it so often, he stops saying it because the redundancy becomes kind of overbearing. So he pulls back, but you can see it clearly as you go through it. And as you continue down, he talks about the church is subject to Christ. And then he moves into the slaves. Slaves, be obedient in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. He continues, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Continues, with good will render service as to the Lord, not to men. He can't get much clearer than this. Then he says, because you know the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Now he principalizes, shifting away from just the slave-master relationship to all who are free, to all of you. You will receive the reward. Now, salvation is a free gift, and Pastor talked about that. I didn't understand that. I was 16 when I came to Christ, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. He, he who knew no sin became sin on my behalf. He paid a debt that I did not owe. And he died in my place. It's called the substitutionary atonement of Christ. He went to the electric chair, so to speak, for all the evil crimes I committed. It's, it's an incredible thing. It's a free gift. Paul and Romans, free, 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 free. 
The only thing that you have to do is receive the gift. If I gave you a gift of a billion dollars, you do have to reach out and receive it. You could reject it. That's the only thing you have to do is receive. To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become a child of God. So in that Liberty Theater in Mexico, Missouri, or in military school, I heard Billy Graham preaching on a video that God loved me, but my sin separated me from God but Christ died on the cross for my sin and all I had to do is receive and I would receive eternal life freely. I couldn't buy it. I couldn't earn it. God doesn't grade on the curve. It, it's just, it, 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 James says you sin one point in the law, you're guilty of all. <laughs> it's just, you, boom. Yeah, the only thing you can do is be perfect. Sin once, and that's what they're teaching. So, but the good news is God provided the way. What a, you should name a church that. You know, I just think. Provided the way. So I understood that. But now, those of us who are in Christ and Christ is in us and we know that salvation is a free gift. Get and you understand what I just said. It's like the Lord says, but I have some add-ons now. Once you're in heaven, I want to be able to say, add a boy, add a girl. Because your obedience your love for him, your reverence, he's not indifferent to that. And it's kind of like he's watching this, you're forgiven, but I love what you just did. And you did it unto me. You touched my heart. You pleased me. And there's cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. It's kind of like there's this handle with a thousand angels on it with your name. And every time, look at that. He put on love toward that wife unto Jesus. Hit it, angels. Cha-ching. And all the gold goes into this silver golden pot. This is a stupid illustration, but you won't forget it. <laughs> look at that. She just put on respect in her demeanor toward his inner heart, even though he's not doing things that are respectable. Hit it, angels. Cha-ching. Whatever good thing each one does, this will receive back from the Lord. New Internationals, you will be rewarded. That's why I call it the rewarded cycle. This is no small deal. This is where he starts in your marriage. Every day he's looking at this. Why? Because you matter to him. This is important to him. And something that's important to Christ is important. And Proverbs 24, 16 says, A righteous man falls seven times, but arises again. Does he expect you to be perfect? Yes or no? No. So don't let defeat defeat you. And I'll tell you this, some of you, some of you hang out with brothers who are on a 10, one to 10 scale. They're, they're like fours, positive. And, and you're a negative three and you keep comparing yourself. You keep comparing yourself, right? And, but Paul says you measure yourselves by yourselves and you compare yourselves with yourselves and you understand nothing. Why do I say that? Because your old man was a minus eight. You progressed. Their old man was a positive eight. They've regressed. I just have to tell you that Jesus Christ isn't paying attention to what you think he is. Instead, he's watching you and he cares about you. Okay. So here's the deal, gentlemen. If you make a decision today, you get on this crazy side with your wife. She's driving me crazy. That's so fitting, Emerson. She just drives me. No, she doesn't. That's your choice and my choice. Everything in me wants to blame Sarah for my negative reactions. But what I've learned is this. If I'm going to do this unto Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ is standing beyond the shoulder of Sarah. And ultimately, I love Sarah, not because I love Sarah, if you understand what I'm saying here, but because I love Christ. Put it this way. If Jesus Christ calls me to love him, which he does, right? And I'm not loving Sarah, what does that mean? I'm not loving Christ. Jesus Christ calls Sarah to reverence him. Not reverence me, but if she's not respecting me and her demeanor, then we would conclude she's probably not reverencing Jesus Christ, even if she's leading worship. It's very important that we understand this. Now, we're all going to fail. Don't beat yourself up. None of us do it perfectly. Sarah chased me around the house with my love and respect book saying, what would you say to a husband treating his wife the way you're treating me right now? We call that negative encouragement. Hopefully you're encouraged by our failings. But you're going to 
fall at times, but you get back up. You get back up and you try it again. Why? Because it's not about this person who's irritating you or annoying you or reacting to you in a way that you keep asking, don't react to me this way. Please stop. If I mattered to you, if you loved me, if you respect, stop. Well, if they are feeling unloved and disrespected, then it's a defensive reaction. Without love, defensively, she reacts offensively without respect. Without respect, defensively, he reacts offensively without love. He's not intending to be offensive. She's not intending to be offensive. We are defensively reacting because at the end of the day, we're far more insecure than any other thing, particularly when our deepest need isn't being met. So we just keep spinning on this thing, taking up offense over a person who has a need that only we can meet. You follow what I'm saying? That's why I said there's an honest misunderstanding. There's not a will here. And just because I feel offended doesn't mean they, in fact, are offensive. A message was sent to Jesus from the Pharisees. They said to Jesus, do you not know that the Pharisees are offended by what you say? So is the Son of God now sinful because the Pharisees are offended? That's their issue. Many people in the culture are offended. It's their issue. And you can be offended toward your spouse, and that could very well be your issue. I'm not saying that it's not. My dad offended my mother when he attempted to strangle her. Don't take my frame of reference there and apply it to all situations because it isn't to be applied to all situations. Some of this is the result of a wife feeling unloved who is defensively reacting in a way that feels disrespectful to you because she's complaining and criticizing, trying ultimately to connect, and you're taking up offense over something that in fact is not offensive. And your husband on the heels of feeling disrespected withdraws to calm down and you say he's unloving and you're offended when he's only trying to be honorable. We've got to kind of lighten up. You're going to die. You know that, don't you? So lighten up. Lighten up. So what does all this mean? Well, it means we do marriage as to the Lord. To hear well done, good and faithful servant, and to receive the reward throughout eternity. I don't know what it looks like. And some people say, well, you should do what you should do without the reward. I just say if the Son of God says he's going to reward you, I suggest to you back off. <laughs> he intends to reward you because you're important to him. And the kingdom's upside down. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. He's not looking at this world the way the world looks at the world. You need to see that some of you are touching his heart deeply. And I will tell you this, everything counts when we do this unto Jesus Christ standing beyond the shoulder of your spouse. Nothing is wasted. This is why I say that in some ways, doing marriage God way, God's way has very little to do with your spouse. I wrote an article called Why Biblical Parenting Has Nothing to Do With Your Children. Fox News kind of went viral on Fox News. What? What are you saying? Marriage has nothing to do with your spouse, we could say. Marriage has nothing to do with your spouse. Not from an eternal perspective. You're not going to be married throughout eternity. Jesus talks to the Sadducees about that. Seven sons, remember, the first son dies, the wife then marries the next, and then in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. It's a trick question. But Jesus says, you're not married in heaven, nor be married in heaven, but you'll be like angels. We are married to the, we are the wife of the lamb, John says. We'll be married, we are the bride of Christ. That doesn't mean that every billion years, where's my husband, honey, where? You gotta, you don't, don't do that. Just trust Christ here. But my point is, marriage is temporary. Though it's permanent on earth, it's temporary from an eternal perspective. And so marriage is a tool and a test to deepen and demonstrate your love and your reverence for Jesus Christ. We've got to lock into that. Now, we, we fail. But there has to be this big yes, and then every day there's a little yes, and there's a whole lot of no's in between. <laughs> no, I'm not going to, I don't care. I'm, I'm mad. Right? Okay. But if we don't do the big yes, I'm committed to the fact that Jesus Christ is standing beyond the shoulder of my spouse, and I'm going to do what I do unto him. And I'm going to lock into the idea that my response is my responsibility. They can't cause me not to love Jesus Christ. They cannot cause me not to be a loving person. They're irrelevant in that sense. And I'm called upon to reverence Jesus Christ. And that's going to spill over onto my husband as a respect toward his inner heart. Because I'm, just, I'm a woman of dignity. I'm civil and I have a demeanor of respect. And I will tell you the command to love and the command to respect means it's not natural to us. 
That's why it's a command. Otherwise, it'd be a moot point to make. So here you have this incredible thing. But I have to come to a point where I say, Sarah doesn't cause me to be unloving. She reveals that I'm unloving. Therefore, if my response is unloving, it reveals that I'm not making a choice that day to love Jesus Christ. There isn't any way I can cut it differently in the scriptures. Well, let me put it this way. You know, but we want to blame. Everything else wants to blame. But a speck of sand in human eye first causes irritation, then not cared for infection, and still not cared for loss of vision. That same speck of sand in an oyster causes irritation, then concretion, and produces what? A pearl. Did the sand cause the results in the eye? Did the sand cause the results in the oyster? No. The sand is an irritant that reveals the inner properties of the human eye and reveals the inner properties of the oyster. Can I let you in on a secret? You're married to an irritant. <laughs> and they are affording you the opportunity to demonstrate to Jesus Christ that you love him and that you want to reverence him. So as we close in prayer, let's just make a decision. Christian's going to be coming to close us here, but make a decision to... There just comes a point where we just say a big yes to this, and then we say, oh, God, through Jesus Christ, I'm going to fail every time unless you help me. And, and I, I wrote the book about this stuff. You talk about pressure, <laughs> right? So don't, don't beat up on yourself. But if you, if, you, if you pull back from this, then you're a bitter person. That's the only thing I can say. You're just, you're just angry. You're angry. And you've been hurt. I understand that. And we're not talking about loving or respecting evil behavior. We've already discounted that. So don't, don't go there with rational. Do you know what it means to rationalize? It's rational lies. So we come to a point of being honest with God. Some of us say throughout the day, honest to God, honest to God, and you never have been. But maybe today you say, Lord, I, 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 before you, I know this is true truth. I, 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 I'm going to say yes to this. This is not about my wife or my husband. And my attitudes and response are just demonstrating at the end of the day that I may not be a true believer. And fewer and fewer people subscribe to the biblical worldview. Begin to say, you know what, I'm going to pick and choose. And I don't, I, I don't, no. Nope. If you sat there even there, you're in the camp on the other side now. But for those of us who really say, no, no, if you put a gun to my head and said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And if I said, no, I know I was lying. So I say, yes. <laughs> then you're in on this. And now it's a matter of saying, God, I never heard this before. Sam Mosier, who headed Nickelodeon, said, I've never heard this teaching, that this isn't about my wife and me. This is about Christ and me. I never connected Christ with my marriage. <laughs> so let's unite our hearts, shall we? And Christian... Father, we just commit these truths to you, and I thank you that this congregation loves you, they reverence you, and Lord, we all feel inadequate because uh, these irritating moments will come. These honest misunderstandings will come when we both want to make cups of coffee. We, we don't want to demand that coffee be made. We simply are trying to make the other happy, but somehow we begin to feel upset with each other. But help us to step back today and realize that at the end of every day, we need to be asking, did I do what I did today as to the Lord, as to you, the one who loves us and will glorify us throughout eternity? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. Can we give Dr. Emerson a round of applause this morning if you learned something? Before we leave, we want to give you an opportunity to take action this morning in response to something you've learned. If we can all just stand to your feet. We have an opportunity today to really make God first in our hearts and our lives. And after what we learn, we know this, that a lot of what we do, especially in our marriages, has to do with our relationship with Jesus. And this morning, that may be a light bulb going off for you in your, in your marriage. Maybe all of this Maybe the drama or the things we've been going through is a result because I need to get my life right with God. Yes. You know, the Bible says that there is a price. There are wages for sin. And by show of hands, how many have sinned? How many have messed up before? We all have. My hand's up too. And the price, just like Dr. Emerson mentioned, is the penalty is death. That illustration of Jesus going to the electric chair 
that was meant for us. The penalty is over our shoulders, but the hope is that God loves you so much and he wants the best for you and he has a plan for your life. He loves you so much that he was willing to pay the price himself so that you can be made whole, be saved and set free. So what do we do to earn that? Nothing. There's nothing we have done or can do to earn that sacrifice that Jesus gave us. It's all because he loves you. So how can you be saved? This morning you can be saved by repenting of your sins. That means turning away from what you know has been holding you back and turning to God. And by putting your faith in Jesus this morning, you can be saved. So today we wanna give you an opportunity to put your faith in Jesus, to give your whole life to him and even to commit your marriage to God, knowing that your marriage depends on your relationship with Jesus. So at the count of three, if that's you, if you're saying, I wanna give my life to Jesus today, then I want you to raise your hand boldly, without any fear or shame, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this room. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand over here. God bless you. I see your hand over here. If you raise your hand this morning, we want to invite you to make one more bold step. Why don't you make your way out of your seat and let us pray with you and congratulate you this morning. And church, let's give them a round of applause as they come forward. If you raise your hand today, come forward. We want to pray with you. Come on up. We want to congratulate you. The Bible says the angels are celebrating in heaven and we're celebrating with you too. We're proud of you. We're proud of you this morning. And I want to make another call. If you're here today, and maybe you're here with your spouse or without your spouse, and you're saying, I want to commit my marriage to the Lord. And I know that I've been doing things maybe my own way. I've been caught in this cycle, this never ending cycle, and I didn't realize it, but today I want to be free. I want to give my marriage, I want to commit my marriage to God. Then at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands. I see you up here, I see you over there. I see you guys, I see you guys. If you raise your hand just now, even if you're a married couple and you want to come up together, I want to invite you to come forward and join us here at this altar as we take action in faith, knowing that God is in control now. And now let's give them a round of applause as they come forward. If you just raise your hand, we want to invite you to come forward today so we can pray with you and agree with you. Amen, they're coming forward right now. We're so grateful. You know, God is doing some incredible things. And if you're up here today, we want to encourage you to take your next step. Be baptized. Take your next step. Join Holy Warriors class. If you need help in growing in your relationship with God, that's what we're here for. We want to help you to grow in your relationship with God. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you, but they're also going to help you get signed up for your next step. So don't leave here today without connecting with them and, learning, and figuring out what your next step is going to be. Are we ready to pray, church? Let's bow our head and let's close our eyes. Father, we thank you. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you for saving me and for setting me free. I believe in you, Jesus, that you died on the cross and you rose from the dead so I can be saved. My faith is in you, not in my own works, but in what you have done. From this day forward, my life will never be the same. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit, with your strength to live this life out that you've called me to live. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen and amen. Can we give God praise this morning? Church, we are so excited that you joined us for session four. Don't forget, tonight is our mass wedding vow renewal and purity ceremony. You can come, you can come dressed up and, and let's celebrate the, the 14 marriages that are gonna happen tonight. And if you wanna renew your vows, you can just come on by tonight. Don't forget, we also have Wednesday night service coming up this Wednesday. You don't wanna miss a powerful word from God. Great things that are happening right now. If you need any prayer, come on up. We'd love to pray for you. God bless you. Remember, if God is for you, there is nobody who can come against you. God bless you, church. Have a great Sunday.